will be given by Dalia Tsuk Mitchell, who's from George Washington University Law School. And Dalia is finishing up a book um, that has been referred to already in the papers of some of the presenters today. And the book's entitled Architect of Justice, Felix S. Cohen and the Founding of American Legal Pluralism, which is going to come out from Cornell University Press. And her paper for us today is Jews and American Legal Pluralism. Thank you. Um, I want to start, like everyone else, by thanking Suzanne and Mark. And actually, I will also thank the participants for, I think, what is turned out to be a really great conference. Um, as Vicky said, this talk I'm going to uh, present today and my paper draws on the intellectual biography of Felix Cohen, which we already heard about his role in, uh, or his famous article, Transcendental Nonsense and the, and the Functional Approach, what I would consider the most what I would consider the most brilliant uh, realist critique of classical legal thought, but he's also known as the guru of federal Indian law, which is what would bring me um, to my talk in a second. And what I do in the biography is actually, in addition to talking about Cohen, I'm also trying to recreate a tradition in American legal thought, which I think has been ignored until this point, and that will be the subject of my, of my talk. So I'll jump right into it and start with a quote that some of you um, have heard, so I apologize, but it's just a great quote, and I cannot let it go. Uh, in 1949, shortly after he left the Department of the Interior, Felix Solomon Cohen wrote the following about his experience defending the rights of Indian tribes. The issue we face is not the issue merely of whether Indians will regain their independence of spirit. Our interest in Indian self-government today is not the interest of sentimentalists or antiquarians. We have a vital concern with Indian self-government because the Indian is to America what the Jew was to the Russian Tsars in Hitler's Germany. For us, the Indian tribe is the miner's canary. And when it flutters and droops, we know that the poison gases of intolerance threaten all other minorities in our land. And who of us is not a member of some minority? So just have this quote in mind when you think back to the sort of tensions between race and nation that I think Willie Forbeth uh, mentioned in his talk. As I argue in this paper, for Felix Cohen, as for many Jewish legal scholars of his generation, the issue was how to protect the rights of diverse groups to be different, to exercise their cultural sovereignty, while at the same time preventing groups from overpowering other groups and maybe even the state. Their struggles to accomplish the task it, uh, produced a particular vision of the modern state, which I label legal pluralist vision. Its insight was that groups and other associations were political, social, and cultural centers in American life, and therefore the success of American democracy demanded that they be given a place within its political and legal structures. The legal pluralist vision, which was rooted in a very substantive understanding of the role of the state in protecting groups and associations, was instead celebrated solidarity and the improvement of economic conditions, provided Jews a sense of inclusion, belonging with others in a struggle against injustice. It allowed them to maintain a particular political identity while rejecting the particularity of ethnic differences. The best example is actually British, the British political pluralist Harold Lasky. Born in 1893 to a wealthy religious Jewish family in England, he was intent on shedding any vestige of his religion. He belonged, as his biographers tell us, to a new group of, and I quote, non-observant Jews who were intensely conscious and proud of their Jewishness. I think that Lasky's political pluralism, which aimed to protect a wide variety of groups, seemed to have grown out of this pride. He thought that by focusing on the unity of the state, traditional absolutist vision of sovereignty obliterated differences of class, politics, and religion. There were no rich or poor, Protestants or Catholics, Republicans or Democrats. They were only members of the state. All groups, trade unionists and capitalists alike, surrender their interest to the state. And Lasky rejected this universalist approach and announced instead that sovereignty was distributive and that all groups actually were sovereign and on a par with the state. Secular, pluralist, and progressives were for Lasky the antithesis of religious, exclusive, and conservative, while the federal structure of the United States uh, became the ultimate symbol of pluralism. American legal scholars, uh, interestingly, were far more reluctant to accept the idea that the state was equivalent uh, with, with any other form of association. 
While they recognize the significance of groups in social and political life, Jewish legal scholars in particular wanted some form of government planning. And here I go back to Morris Cohen, who we already heard attacked cultural pluralism, and I would say opposed anything plural. Um, Morris Cohen, when he wrote about Lasky's political pluralism, noted the dangers <coughs> that, and I quote, small groups or communities may be far more oppressive to the individual than larger ones. And that, and I quote again, if the state gives up its sovereignty over any group, there will be nothing to prevent that group from oppressing the rest of the community. Cohen fully recognized the wisdom, and, and I quote again, of large measures of home rule or autonomy to be accorded to various local, vocational, and religious organizations. But he remained concerned that, uh, about allowing associations or groups freely to exercise their power. What I would say is that Cohen's um, concerns were the concerns of a first-generation Jewish American afraid of discrimination and oppression from other groups, as well as from his own Jewish community. His critique of Lasky's political pluralism led the foundation for the last variant, legal pluralism, a theory that recognized both the need to encourage the growth of groups and also to limit their power. Which brings me to the last uh, element in legal pluralism, legal realism. As Morty told us, the legal, uh, legal realism were grounded in skepticism toward existing values and structures of, no, of thought. But once realists tried to translate their critique into creating a better legal system, they were confronted with what I would say um, the dilemma of pluralism. Did their skepticism imply a non-judgmental attitude to, toward all customs and values? No scholar that I know of, and I hope Morty doesn't correct me, <laughs> uh, suspend the judgment toward all values and cultures. The uncertainty of a radically relativist approach was simply too great for these intellectuals to embrace. And I think it was just an intellectual crisis or an individual crisis. Instead, legal realists tried different ways out of the dilemma. Some endorsed cultural and ethical relativism and trusted empirical studies or science to, to point them to the appropriate system of values. Also, they're more social scientists. Others uh, challenged absolute structures of knowledge such as science, but accepted some sort of, not absolute, but known moral set of moral values. The leg their legal realism was a combination of skepticism toward traditional structures of knowledge or cognitive relativism and a degree of ethical, I would even say, absolutism. Many of those were Jews. The legal pluralist image of the state provided a different way out of the dilemma. By embracing groups as lo like labor uni unions, as centers where individuals found meanings, legal pluralists maintained a certain skepticism toward absolute norms or universal norms. Groups could pursue their own values. At the same time, pluralist, legal pluralists also demanded absolute norms outside group boundaries, for example, the norms regulating the power of collectivities, especially corporations. Rather than choosing between relativism and absolutism, legal pluralists saw their task as defining the appropriate boundaries between group autonomy and the limits on group power, or as I would say, the normative limits of their celebration of diversity. I go into a lot of detail, not here, about the influence of legal pluralism on the New Deal policies, the early New Deal. What I want to talk about now is actually Felix Coins dealing with Native Americans during the New Deal. I do want to point not feeling at home in America, that actually his son was feeling much more at home in America, although I think his legal pluralism was a way of becoming part of American society. In the early 1930s, as Cohen took his first steps as a practicing lawyer, he followed many progressive era scholars by rejecting ethnic particular, particularism and emphasizing economic improvement through th solidarity and collaboration among groups. <laughs> this was the premise of a wonderful document labeled a socialist constitution for the Commonwealth of the United States that Cohen and a few of his friends drafted in the mid-19th centuries. Uh, sorry, mid-1930s. It envisioned individuals forming associations that would enter agreements and create a whole pyramid of collective institutions. 